can I tell you about identity? I was, Salpi said, talk about identity, talk about Armenian identity, talk about diaspora identity, whichever you like. Um, as Alex uh, said, or was it Mr. Israelian who said it, as we become a global world, the demands made on us and our identity change. Identity used to be so local that your family, your parish, your village were most involved in determining it. That's grown in the 19th century to your nation, and now identity is in some sense transnational. I got into trouble some years ago writing an article in which I said, I sometimes wonder if we Armenians are a nation or whether we are a trans nation. And I explained that a trans nation is a structure which can stretch across the globe, across a number of diaspora communities that are very different from each other, to the Republic of Armenia and to Karabakh, which is not identical with either Armenia or, of course, diaspora communities. That is to say, if we are all Armenians, what kind of identity could possibly be common to us all? Uh, Mr. Sardar spoke and he said, our troops were attacked. And he was right. We're here. M many of us have never been to Karabakh. Certainly none of us have served in the army. And yet we say, our troops have been attacked. What is the nature of identity that enables you to say that our, without hesitation? Okay. The good news is that there's no answer to that. When you look at the enormous literature on identity, the scholarly research, just the section on anthropological and political research on identity in the Oxford bibliography, which I checked being a professor, is 123 pages long. That's the bibliography, not the actual text. And when you look and ask what do they say identity is, there's almost a complete rejection among contemporary scholars of the checklist approach. What would be the checklist approach? Well, let's see. Um, to, be, to, have, to have a certain identity, if you ask my American students, they would say, oh, a race, class, and gender, right? And maybe sexual orientation and ethnicity. In other words, American liberal arts universities teach students that the common elements of an identity are race, that's a very US-influenced uh, category. Do you think Armenians have racial identity? Are you aware, as Armenians, of your racial identity? Well, I'll tell you, if you're a dark-haired Armenian and you emigrate to northern Russia among all the blonde Slavs, you're immediately aware of your racial identity. Much of the time, we don't think we have race, but of course we do. Gender and so forth, all the race, gender, class, ethnonational identity, sexual orientation, we Armenians would add religion and language. We could inflate the list of the checklist. The thing about the checklist is that it's useful to think with, but it can't be defining. You all know that in the course of a long history, we were once not Christian. Then we were Christian. We're still Christian, but some of us are post-Christian. Religion cannot define us. We, in the 1820s, Armenian apostolic clergy argued that people who converted to Catholicism or Protestantism ceased to be Armenian. Most of us don't think that way anymore. Each of the identity categories that are on the checklist can be challenged in some way. There are people who think that if your sexual orientation turns out to be not heterosexual, in some way you are at least a scandal and possibly pose a danger to Armenian morals. In Armenia, there's a big struggle going on just about those things. So what I would say is that to the extent that there's a checklist approach, I would reject it. At the same time, when I was four years old, my nanny was a survivor of the genocide. I was brought up at Halep, Aleppo. And one day she explained to me something about her narrative, her story. And she said, Menk Hayek, Menk Dajigal Lal Chekguzer. We don't want to be a Dajik. I don't know if the word Dajik is even familiar to many of the younger among you. Not Turk, not Muslim, but Dajik. It's a way of speaking among Armenians. Today, in the van that brought us over from the hotel, two people were talking about the way in which in Turkey now, there are people appearing who are saying, we're Armenian, but our ancestors converted to Islam during the genocide. We're Muslim. We want to be Muslim and Armenian. 
So my nanny, Taku Khatun, may, have been, may be proven mistaken. There may be Armenians who are Dajigs as well. And how are we going to manage that identity? The thing is, I have far more questions than I have answers. The only comfort I can offer you is the entire set of professions, from psychology to social psychology to anthropolo anthropology, anthropology to political science that studies political identity, they don't have answers. They have a lot of questions, they have a lot of examples, but there is no consensus among people who spend their time studying identity about identity. So I can't convey a consensus to you. I can make a set of remarks. Two things that everybody agrees on. One is that there's no such thing as identity, whether individual or collective, without memory. Way back 17th century, John Locke said, what is it that could possibly unite the infant that I was once to the old man that I have become? One wouldn't recognize the other. He said, the only thing that can unite it is some continuity of body inhabited by memory. So personal identity is attached to memory. And when you see the tragedy of Alzheimer's advanced, when memory disappears, you see that in a certain sense, even though the body of the person is their identity has disappeared. Just as memory matters tremendously to the individual, it matters to the community. When I was flying here, I was in Logan, Boston, the person standing behind me made a remark, a gentleman maybe a few years older than me. We started talking. He said, what are you doing? Going to USC, why? To give this talk. He said, you know, I'm Armenian. He told me his name, I recognize it. He's a famous surgeon, uh, now retired, but very famous surgeon, like with multiple honors. I said, so I'm going to ask you a very abrupt question. Will you answer it? He said, sure. Said, What's your identity? He said, my identity. I don't know. I think like every identity. I said, okay, what's every identity? He said, I suppose identity is personal memory of personal experiences plus cultural memory of the cultural experience of the nation you belong to. Perfect answer in a sense. I mean, one of the fundamental elements. And then he said, of course, the memories would be different if you were in homeland or in diaspora. We're in diaspora. So my personal and cultural memories also include the memory of the society I live in. So to some degree, I have to struggle with my identity to integrate cultural memory of the Armenians and the cultural memory of America, which are so different. And the ideal, he said, is to have an identity that both draws on the receiving society and contributes to it. He said this as flawlessly as I'm just speaking, like he didn't have to think about it, he just came up with it. A day before I came, I was talking to a friend, a middle-aged Armenian woman, and I said, same question, just don't think, just tell me, what's your identity? I said, what's your Armenian identity? She said, well, I'm a Kesapti. Mostly, I spend my Armenian time with other Kesaptis. I don't really spend that much time with Armenians who are not Kesapti, unless they're exactly in my economic and sociocultural circle. She's very prosperous. And she said, also I'm Armenian because I give money to Armenia every year. And she named the institution to which she gives several thousand dollars a year. So what is identity? Kesab, one of, in, in entire diaspora, there are very few places that have as territorialized an identity as Kesab. And she said, when I go there, I'm a, I realize that this is home. No place else is home in the same way. And that brings up an, another element of identity. Your identity, to some degree, is established by where you feel at home, where you belong. I cannot have a territorialized identity. The first time I went to Armenia was 1994. I spent two weeks there, two good weeks, difficult times, good weeks. When I was coming back, I flew through Paris. And when I was in Paris, a group of us went to a, 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 essentially a garden cafe, and we were sitting there. There was me, there was a woman named Arpik Bisakyan, the editor of Haraj, the preeminent Armenian newspaper of Western Europe. Her assistant, uh, who also an Armenian from Istanbul. Bedros Terzian, a man from Lebanon. Krikor Bulidian, a man from Lebanon. Apo Berejiklian, like me originally from Aleppo. We were talking. We were talking in Armenian, some French sentences thrown in, some Turkish, some Arabic. And I realized with a real deep sadness, I just spent two weeks in Armenia for the first time never felt at home there the way I feel at home with these people. For me, being Armenian is not a place. It's being with certain kinds of people. My identity only exhibits itself fully 
with certain groups of people. I don't have a home. I don't have belonging except when I'm with certain people. One of the, what the postmodernists say is that this is more and more the condition of humanity. That even people who have not left their homeland at all, say the south of the United States, increasingly feel that they don't have a territorialized identity. That, that's one of the things that's happened is that identity has been pulled away from territory. So, in the way in which people think about identity, we say that it's a paradox. On the one hand, there's a unique identity. Every one of us not only has unique DNA, even identical twins don't have identical fingerprints. We have, at a certain biological level, there's a uniqueness. But from the moment of the birth of that DNA uniqueness, of that biological uniqueness, what we are invited to do, what we are forced to do in a sense, when we're infants, is that identities are projected upon us. Feminists say, and they're entirely right, that one of the very first questions asked of a newborn infant is, boy or girl? And the moment you hear boy or girl, without anyone, neither the parents nor, of course, the infant knowing it, a whole set of projections and narratives or identities are directed towards that infant. It is essentially told to grow up, to live according to a narrative of identity. I once had a homosexual acquaintance say to me, I realized only when I was about 30 and my parents realized, no, I was never going to marry. This was the days before homosexuals married. Said, so when I was born, one of the many things they did was project on me a narrative. He's going to go to college and then he's going to get married and give us grandchildren. They said, that, the, that identity was never something I chose. It's simply projected upon me. A large part of identity is a projection. You will be like this. You will do these things. You will, if you'll allow me to use a, a colloquialism, you will learn to talk the talk and walk the walk of a particular series of identities. How to be a man or a woman, how to be an Armenian, how to belong to your class, etc., etc. You can go down the checklist. And there are people who are very willing to do this. There's a guy in Armenia who 10, 12 years ago wrote a pamphlet. I wish I had it, but I couldn't find it. Uh, it was about uh, Ov Haye, who is an Armenian. He was going to tell you. He proceeded to tell you what you need to be and do to be an Armenian. If there's anything I want to convey to you today, it's that in my view, never at any time in history have there been so many options, so many ways of having and living out an Armenian identity. Think of how punitive the situation was if you were born an Armenian peasant uh, somewhere in Sasun 200 years ago. Your family, local, very narrow, the furthest distance they traveled was Mush, Bitlis, or Dikranager. Your family was patriarchal. It told you how to behave. The Kurdish Agha told you how to behave. The Ottoman state told you how to behave. The Armenian church told you how to behave. There were models and you had to live according to them. And the system was very punitive. Harder even on women than on men, but really punitive for everyone. You had to walk a very tight line. The script of identity that you had to perform was preset. What has happened for a set of you know, reasons that we don't need to go into in a brief conversation is that the number of scripts which you can perform and still be an Armenian has increased. Now, we're not all happy with all of the scripts by any means. I don't mean to say that I am or you should necessarily be. But if there's anything you want to take away from this talk, it's this notion that your Armenian identity is really now able to be a set of identifications. You can say, I identify as that kind of Ar Armenian. I identify with that way of doing Armenian things. This change in options is both a richness, a fortune for us, and at the same time it's a cause of great difficulties because collective action becomes harder and harder when the number of identity scripts that people perform just keeps on increasing. And people try to write their own scripts. They create, try to create uh, their own patterns. There is no easy way out of it. The, uh, probably next to memory, the thing that most matters to people who do scholarship, who do research on identity, is the question of difference and similarity. I think this is obvious, but it needs to be said. You never are just what you are. Whether you know it or not, you establish your own identity by saying, I'm not them. As my old nanny Taku Khatun, Taku Khatun said, Meng Dajik Chenk. 
To be an Armenian is not to be a Muslim. It's to be an Armenian Christian. Fundamental for her. So when you affirm yourself, you simultaneously declare your similarity to a group and your difference from another. Anthropologists spend a lot of time studying where the boundaries are. Where consciously or unconsciously we say, here I stop being part of this group, I move into another, or here I draw the line, I don't want to be like them, I want to be part of this group and like this group. The, along with memory and with difference, the thing that's fun, a kind of fundamental identity process is, as I said before, that we start unique, but we have this desire that social psychologists have studied a great deal to be part of social groups. There is a kind of paradox, isn't there? Look at, look at the kids who are online on, on, on Facebook trying to curate a very unique identity, right? That this, is, this is a sort of cool identity that I carefully cultivate, so it shows how special I am. But part of the reason they're cultivating that very unique identity is so they can be part of the group they want to be in. And that's the nature of identity. It's simultaneously deeply unique and individual. We really are, each of us, unique, as I said, from DNA fingerprints on up. And one of the built-in elements of humanity is that we want to belong to groups. Whether you're gang, you know, gangbangers or whatever, you want to belong to groups. There is virtually no human being who is truly a hermit. Or when there are, they are the exceptions that affirm the rule. The question is, who gets to choose which group you belong to? Huge research literature about in-groups and out-groups. The one thing that they confirm is the human paradox is that on the one hand we want to declare our uniqueness and on the other hand we want to belong to groups, but we want to choose the group we belong to. And that choice is never entirely up to us. You can say, I am a, an X. Other people who are already X have to say, yes, you're an X, you can join. And in addition, there's often a greater force, a greater social force that says, yes, you're an X. No, you're not an X. We recognize you, we don't recognize you. Think of the, few, of the first day after childbirth. Already I mentioned how you look at gender and you say, tell a story about the boy or the girl. But you do other things. You register a name. Father, mother, last name. That already establishes you, puts you into a family and a kinship group. In certain countries, at certain times, you have to put down religion. In Turkey, there has been a debate recently, I'm not sure where it is, but there are people here from Turkey who can tell us, where the question of should the religion be put in the birth certificate and in the identity papers came up. Um, if you go to a hospital, they ask you what your religious identity is in many places in the United States. Um, they assign you citizenship or refuse to assign you citizenship. In the US, they put down race. The categories come right down on you from the very beginning, and you choose to exchange those categories to step out of them only at a certain cost. Western literature, you know I teach literature by profession, is full of stories of conversion. When you convert, you really are saying, I give up this identity for that one. To us now, it's hard to understand, unless you're following ISIS and what's happening in Raqqa, what a huge thing conversion used to be. What an enormous thing religious conversion was. People died for it, as you know. Nahadagder, martyrs, etc., etc. And it's always wrenching. So one of the questions about identity is, sure, there are a multiplicity of scripts. Sure, there are more choices than ever. Sure, you don't have to be purely this or purely that. There is a lot of hybridity that's possible nowadays. But the question abides, what are the conversions that you most desire that are most difficult, that you have to pay the highest cost for. When Armenia became independent, Levon Terbedrosian said, why should we give diaspora Armenians Armenian citizenship? Because they have Armenian identity. The people who live here have to suffer the conditions of here. They have to, if they're males, they have to fight and die for this. They have to pay taxes. Why would you, on the ground of identity, claim that you deserve Armenian citizenship. Some of you are old enough to remember that debate from 1991 on, really, until Kocharyan. You, and it's a, if you look at it closely, the question was that in diaspora, we thought identity was that thing that we sustained by our passion, by all the work, as Mr. Israelia mentioned, all the work of philanthropists, all the work of people who gave their luma, their tiny contributions to make things happen, who gave their time of their lives to make things happen. 
That's, there's so much passionate Armenian identity involved in the sacrifices that make a diaspora work that you forget that there are other kinds of sacrifices that establish identity under other conditions elsewhere. We still, I think, are in that difficult situation of having deep beliefs and identity that are not congruent. If you talk to Armenians in Armenia, very few Armenians I've talked to from Karabakh, Armenians in diaspora, we still don't have a resolution on whether there is a transnational Armenian identity that we all have. I don't know whether you guys think that there is such a thing. Um, I have the difficulty of simultaneously saying our soldiers have been attacked and yet not being able to spell out what, what identity I actually share with uh, Armenians there. So I'm going to finish by talking for a few minutes about what scholars call subjective and objective identity, what I call talking the talk and walking the walk. Um, as Alex Sardar mentioned, I edit a journal, I founded and edited a journal called Diaspora, and in its pages there was once a debate between an Armenian sociologist, Annie Bakalyan, who has written the one really good book about Armenian identity in America, but she believes it's a symbolic identity, I can explain that, and between her and Susan Patty, an Armenian anthropologist, and what was their argument about? The argument was the following. Annie Bakalyan, as a sociologist who had done social science research on Armenian identity, said the vast majority of Armenians are nostalgic ethnics with only symbolic identity. They're like the Irish. You know how the Irish, it's St. Patrick's Day, the beer is green, they parade? Then they go back. They claim an identity, but that identity has no effective, active presence in their daily life. So in a certain language, they talk the talk of Irishness, they have a symbol of Irishness, St. Patrick's Day, a shamrock, whatever, but in their lives, they don't walk the walk. They are not required to do Irish things. In northeastern United States, in the Boston area, during the time of the IRA bombings, there were secret Irish organizations that collected money for the IRA, but they were very much the exception to the rule, and of course, the U.S arrested them when they found this out. The question of walking the walk is a very difficult one for the following reason. Susan Patty, the anthropologist, said, you know, being an Armenian doesn't exactly convey a whole lot of privileges upon you. So when someone says, I am Armenian, I subjectively declare that I am Armenian, I talk the talk, how do you get off saying, no you're not, or yeah, you're just, you know, you have a symbolic identity. You don't really have a real identity. That requires you to walk the walk. That requires you to show in one of the thousand possible ways that you're attached to the Armenian people in some way, as yet unspelled. That debate about subjective and objective claims to identity has repeated itself for generations. My father, who was himself a very active man in Armenian life, would say about certain people, Ayo hayen, it's bluff hayen. Bluff in Armenian is the word for bluffing, as in poker or blot. He meant, he meant simply, you know, sure, I know that they're born of Armenian parents and say they are. But to him, he was at ARF Tashnak Tagan all his life, you had to put something on the line. Your money to start with, your effort, something. And this is a debate that's not simply, of course, among us. The question of is identity something that can simply be claimed by saying, I am, or does identity have to be acted out, have to be performed, not only on the stage of life, but performed at some cost to yourself. Whether it's labor, time, money, Karl Marx once said that all you have is the time of your life. When you work, you're selling the time of your life to your employer. You're selling the energy of your life to your employer. When you take the little money that you have as a panvor, as a worker, and you give it to an Armenian organization, as so many did in their small donations, you are giving your life. It's very useful to remember that aspect of Marx. Next time you give $100 to something, I don't want to discourage you from doing it, just stop and say, wait, how long did I work for that? Could be 10 minutes if you're a cardiologist, and it could be five hours if you're not. You're giving your life, and for many people, Identity is only demonstrable if you do that. Uh, each of you has to ask to yourselves whether in fact you believe you have an army and identity, whether you have that identity because you say it, 
Do you do more than that? Do you perform your identity publicly? Do you say in conversations with other people, it's not okay for you to say that. I'm Armenian and this is how I feel about what's happening in Turkey or somewhere else. That's starting to put yourself on the line all the way down to what else are you willing to do? How much are you willing to walk the walk? Finally, the question is, is there a legitimate authority anywhere that assigns identity? That's a very hard question. A lot of the identity that my students display, they're still young, is identity that doesn't come from their parents, from their teachers, from their priests, from any of those things. It's something they cobble together, they put together from the media to which they are so totally attached. Okay, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be done in one minute. Um, one of the things that has happened that the digital world, the transnational and global world has done is that the authority to be something comes to the young to a remarkable degree, not from the usual sources that validate uh, individual identity, it comes from the performance in the media. A relative of mine told me one day that she wanted to learn Japanese. She was 14. I said, why? She said, because I love Little Tokyo. I said, what do you know about Little Tokyo? Turned out there was a group called Little Tokyo that she'd found online, fallen in love with, and just focused all of her interest to that, to learn Japanese, to become connected to that. It's, to, to me, it's because I, I grew up before that, it's amazing to what degree the authority that says to you, this is the uh, identity that you want, now comes from the media. So those two elements I'll leave you with, or three elements. One, the possibilities of identity are larger in number and can be self-authored more than ever before. They still have a cost. There's no such thing as abandoning one identity and claiming another without cost and time and money and energy and more dangerous things in certain places. And I hope that, especially those of you who are, have the good fortune to be young at this time, you're able to reject the way in which your communities sometimes will tell you uh, that you shouldn't try out being an Armenian in that way. I have he heard people say to me, one person said to me, you're not a full-time Armenian, you're a part-time Armenian. And I thought, really, you know a lot of full-time Armenians? Uh, of course I'm a part-time. I live in a town of 45,000. There are two Armenians in it. The other one, the only way he's Armenian is his last name is Kalajan, fourth, fourth generation Armenian American. Of course I'm a part-time Armenian. Don't worry about being a part-time Armenian. Don't worry about being a hybrid Armenian. Just choose your script to the degree that you can choose it, to the degree that your family, your friends, your circle, and act it out. The worst thing is not to engage, not to participate, not to author your own individual identity at a time when more than ever that is possible. Thank you.